Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves going again. And lots of good questions at the break there. And as you have more questions about specific things, if things are coming up and there's questions in your mind and you know, you're sort of jumping ahead to concepts for your group, like don't wait for me. I'll be back in two weeks, but uh, don't wait. Like send me an email or something like that. In fact, let me kind of tell you how to get to that just so you sort of know because I'll forget to do this at the end of the class. Can I even get out of there? Let me see if I can get to that. There's a couple things I want to let you know about that are kind of good places for you to sort of see. And runtime errors don't in, aren't included amongst them. But I was messing around with Skype, installing an extension, and it uh, sort of messed me up for life. Okay. Well, a good site for you to know about is this one. Bimtopia is actually my little blog site where I go ahead and post things like videos from classes like this, videos from my Stanford classes. Oh, there's a bunch of stuff out here from the whole Autodesk BIM curriculum. That is something that I worked on with a bunch of Stanford students a couple years ago. Let me kind of just kind of show you what that looks like. So, for example, on this whole issue of multidisciplinary collaboration, modeling structural elements, modeling electrical and plumbing systems, if you want to sort of get ahead, or you were sort of, you know, the whole notion of like how you did linking to different uh, oh, uh, grids and levels and the copy monitoring, if you sort of miss some of that and you want to go back, it's in this lesson right here, preparing to share models. And if you go popping on out there, there are actually all sorts of little exercises, which include little video tutorials, which are out on YouTube. You can actually just find them on YouTube also if you go search for Bintopia, where if you go clicking there. Our first step is to set levels, grids, and reference planes. So that's Laura, who was a student in class a couple of years ago, uh, doing the recording of all this. dimensional framework. And we just actually put together there's about eight hours worth of videos talking about all sorts of things in little like four to ten minute snippets and stuff like that. So Bintopia is sort of a good site for you in terms of actually finding a lot of information. What happens is I answer questions out here. So, oh, what is it? My classes at Stanford are here. We'll go ahead and have a little tab there for your USC class. And just if people ask good questions, I just make little videos out of them and post them because I bet if you've got a question like how do you get the image file in as a background to trace it, I guarantee you engineering students at other schools are having the same question. So it becomes good stuff to share. So a big part is let's, you know, being an online community and you post and share your questions. You have cool tips that you sort of see, send them in. You know, we, we sort of support each other that way. Another thing that's good for you on this site though is way down at the bottom, you actually find my information which is so glenn at autodesk.com as well as my phone which rings on through and I will answer it as long as it's not actually in the middle of class that happens too so uh, just go ahead and send me emails and questions and things you have and stuff like that and we'll do our best to answer them so yeah you don't have to go waiting two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is because you know we're here for the duration with you on this class and going to get you through it so uh, we're just a, like your TAs we're just another one of your technical resources available to you so yeah, treat us all as a big team working together on this stuff. Okay, so I guess we, uh, you know, to I guess to survive, we all need to work together. <laughs> There's really a, a lot of work you guys are going to be going through, and you know, you need all the the support you can to get through it all to to make it all happen. So that's just sort of how you get a hold of us and how you like uh, find oh all this stuff that's already posted. But let me go back into the the structure program. We're going to do a couple more things than just in finishing up today. Let me go a little further on the structure stuff just to give you sort of a clue or kind of so you can start thinking ahead if you want to start modeling your structural pieces in addition to your architectural things. But again, start with the architecture, get the levels and grids. Okay. Then you can start putting the structure in here. Let me just kind of show you where we're going to go and kind of copy it up just so you get a sense of that. Although we're going to talk about structural modeling and MEP modeling in more detail next time. And then I'm going to shift gears a little bit and just talk about the level of detail in your model. I'm going to get that out a little bit too. But here we got our structural model. It's got some basic columns in there we added last time. So let's kind of think about what you need to do next, just to kind of give you a little preview. The way I tend to model structures is I'll model the columns first. Then I'll go through and I'll model the beams between the columns. Then I'll put in joists or kind of subordinate beams between those. And finally, we'll go ahead and like uh, kind of copy and paste those different elements up between the different floors. You're going to find that in a lot of buildings, there's a very regular pattern. If you do your modeling on one floor, the easiest thing to do is copy and paste and kind of bring it up. And it lets you very quickly start constructing, oh, just, uh, you know, very detailed models in terms of what you want to see. So in terms of putting beams in there, there's a lot of different techniques for doing this. But let me kind of show you one of the quickest ones. And that's actually to just go ahead and place them in 3D. 
One of the problems with beams that you're going to find out as we work with them is when you place beams relative to sort of how things work in drafting programs, in drafting programs, when we work with things or modeling programs, we tend to be cutting it four feet looking down. And the problem is with these beams, we're going to put them in there, but we actually want to be looking up because the beams are going to go above our head. So you got the sort of funny choice. You're either going to put the beams on level two looking down, or you can go to level one and do a ceiling plan view and look up. Okay, either way sort of works. Or you can place them in 3D. You know, either, you know there's like different methods. We'll kind of show you all those next time, but I'm going to place them in 3D now just to kind of help us get started. One thing to know when we're placing beams, though, we have the same sort of notion of there's kind of a so default assumption about how big they may be. Okay, and again, this is just kind of a placeholder because our analysis software is ultimately going to tell us how big those things should be. I'm going to actually choose the placement plane. I'm going to put them on level two. If I left it on level one, it might try to put them down on the ground. I want to put them up at the level two level. I'm going to leave on 3D snapping. I'm going to just click on the top of that column to the top of that column. And click on the top of that column to the top of that column. And why don't you go ahead and try that? Just start putting some in. Okay, and while you're at it, you might kind of do them the other direction too. We'll sort of assume this is sort of a very regularly spaced structure, although it's not really quite as regular as I'm doing it right here, but this is enough to get us started. Okay, and this is to give you a taste of where we're going. So put a, you might just put a bay or two in there. Okay, as you're doing this though, I'm gonna caution you about sort of one thing to watch out for. There's this whole thing about a general principle you should follow, and that is we should try to model things as much as possible the way they will be built. Okay, and let me even kind of shade these so you can sort of see them a little bit better. And then we'll kind of zoom on in and talk about that. Here's the deal. If we go looking at some of those things, you might notice those orange lines floating around on top of the beams. Those are the analytical lines. So from an analysis standpoint, that's where it thinks the beam is and how the beams are connected to the columns and all that type of stuff. So if we start drawing our shear and bending moment diagrams, that's where it's considered to be. The truth is, though, as you're modeling, you're going to start getting into this thing where I'm going to tell you to Rather than sort of putting steel beams right at the floor level, okay, we actually lower them below the floor level because we want the top of the concrete to be at the floor level, but we have to have room for the concrete and room for the deck. So what happens is the beams don't really go right at level two. They tend to actually go at level two minus a number of inches, however thick that floor plate is. And in Revit, the default one is five inches thick in terms of like some lightweight concrete and some decking underneath it. So what we would do is, if we would really like to have accurate details and have our model sort of reflect things accurately from an estimating standpoint, as well as for doing construction details right out of the model, what we should do is for these beams, not actually put them right at level two, okay? But we're gonna offset them a little. We're gonna drop them down a little bit. Now, in these choices, there's this notion of a start level offset and an end level offset. That is, as opposed to being perfectly horizontal, if I can do that with my elbows not bending, you know, if I want them to tilt like this or I want them to slope like that, I can put a start or an end level offset and kind of tilt them. If I want them just to go up or down level, okay, what I'm going to do is actually change this thing called the Z direction justification. And rather than having the top of the beam be right at the level line, okay, I'm going to change it to something called other and drop it down a little bit. I'm going to drop it down minus five inches. Okay, again, we'll talk about this more next time in terms of the importance of doing that. But what happens is, if you can sort of look at the little detail over there, okay, that column or that beam is just down a little bit. So as we're placing steel beams, we're going to start doing that. And actually, don't worry if your beams sort of end up in the wrong location at first. It's really easy. Remember I made that comment about dragging and filtering? Because you do things like you have them in the wrong level, you want to choose all the beams, and then you want to change them all as one big batch to be minus five inches. Okay, very common operation. So you're going to learn to sort of drag and select and filter a lot because it's your quickest way to kind of grab a bunch of different things and kind of make that happen. Okay, so we're going to start by next time placing some beams. Then we're going to go through and put in something called a beam system. A beam system is really just a series of smaller beams or joists. And the reason we use these is 
If these are 20 by 30 or whatever my base size is, that steel decking is not going to be strong enough to span 20 feet. We need to put in some intermediate joys for some smaller things to support that. So what we can do is, let me find the parameters of the system. So my screen is sort of swishy, so it's, it's hard to sort of figure out exactly what's going on here. But what I'm going to do is I have these choices of, for example, choosing supports. If I choose supports, that means I'm going to actually choose beams that are going to be the edges. You're going to find out, we're going to, if we're modeling, we're going to have a hierarchy of things. Put the grids in and put the columns at the grids. Then put the beams between the columns. Then put the beam systems resting on the beams. And then finally put the floor decking on top of the beam systems. And if you do it that way, it'll understand the hierarchy of how loads get transferred down. And if anything moves, everything sort of downstream will move appropriately with it. So there is kind of a, it's not just that you're putting it arbitrarily at a point in space. You're putting it in a, in a relationship to another element. So these joists really do want to sort of be bearing on some of these different uh, beams. So, oh, I'll run my joists in this direction. Actually, what happens when I do this with a picking is the first one I pick is going to indicate the direction of the joists. In this case, it's going to run in the short direction. I'll go through and choose the rest of the boundary here. Okay. I can put in an elevation. That is, if I'd like the joist to be minus five inches also to match the beams, I can put that in here. And then I can actually go through and choose what is the section look like and what the spacing is on the section. So if I want a lot of these wide flange beams at six feet, I could say apply and say enter. Okay, it'll put a bunch of beams in there. But the nice things about beam systems or joist systems is if you choose the entire system, I just, let me show that again. I hovered over it and I tabbed to get the whole system. Now I can go through and change it to be, oh, every four feet or every three feet, or if I don't even like the wide flange section. If instead of the wide flange section, I want to put in little uh, oh, bar joists, so something that has more of an open web to it. I can do that. I'll just come on out. I'll load in a family. You're going to find there's these structural families full of things like, oh, for steel. Let's see if I can find it. Framing, steel. And I'll say, oh, a K-series bar joists. We do the rods or angles. I do the rods. It's a very small little uh, connecting members. I can choose the depth that I want and a size, kind of like from the catalog. Okay, that's just going to load them in and make them available to me, kind of like things in the whole Revit library. Things, if you load them in, then they're available to choose. And now I can come back and say that, okay, for the system, let me tab and get it. I will choose oh, one of those sizes instead, one of the 18-inch ones. Okay, and the K-joists are in there. And what we're going to do is just sort of build up our structure this way, first building it on the first floor level, and that looks pretty good. But what's going to happen is we're going to then move up from here, grab all those different things over here, okay. and what I'll do is just copy them onto the clipboard, and I can actually just paste them to the other levels. So if you have a very regularly spaced structure, and we tend to have pretty, well, kind of depends on how organic the form is. Often we can start with a very regularly spaced structural system and then start adapting it and differentiating it as needed. Okay, But I can say align it to some different levels. And I'll put that on. It's going to sound weird. I'm going to put it on level three and the roof. Even though all those columns are at level one and the supporting level two, thinks about them as being on level two. So I'm going to put it on level three and roof because it already thinks there's something at level two. Yeah, this guy sounds weird, but you'll get used to this. Okay, and we very quickly can start creating a multi-story tower or something like that by doing that kind of operation. So again, if that went by really quickly, don't sweat it. We're going to do that in a lot of detail next time. That's just a little preview of the coming attraction for people who want to get dive again. But you have a question, so go ahead and ask it. Yeah. yeah. No worries, let's show you that again. Okay, so here I am, I just did an undo. I got all this stuff down on the first floor level. What I'm going to do is just grab it all. What's that? Oh, those beams. No worries, let's put another bay worth in them. That's fine. We'll go to home. Instead of being beams, it's called a beam system. Okay, grab that. 
And the beam system tool lets you do this. Under draw, we can sort of choose the boundaries. And what I go ahead and choose is this one that says pick the supports. And I can say choose that side, this side, and I just choose all four of the boundaries. Okay, it's kind of keeping the same distance there. Let me change it to the size of the member that I want. And then I can close it up. And choose, oh, that spacing doesn't look very good. I'll choose a different spacing in there. It's hard to see, there it is right there. And I'll make it like every three feet or every four feet, whatever it was to match. Okay. So that's kind of the idea, but go ahead, think about doing it on one level, and then we'll start copying and pasting it up to the other levels and be in pretty good shape. In fact, there's other ways we could do that. We could array it up there if we wanted to have everything that we make a change on one level reflect on all the other levels. There's ways we can do that to kind of even give you sort of more power to it. But that's just kind of a preview of structural modeling. Yeah. No? You're, oh, you're, you're waiting. <laughs> you're just stretching. Ah, very good question. What happens is if I go back, it's going to sound a little strange. Let me zoom on in. You have to tab a couple times till you can select the system. So I tabbed once, and now I can select the whole system. And then I can say edit it. So see that line right there? That's the line that indicates the direction. If I choose beam direction as opposed to boundary line, I can pick another side. And then I'll just rotate them around the other direction instead. Okay, so it'll always be the first one you place will be presumed to be the beam direction, but then you can adapt it if you need to. Okay, so beam systems, incredibly powerful stuff, but I think what you're going to figure out pretty quickly is that structurally modeling isn't so bad. If you get the architectural modeling down right and you have a, a good, relatively regular structural skeletal system and the grids are all laid out nicely, you know, there's some funny things about some cantilevers and weird conditions to sort of frame up, but just trying to do sort of a very regularly framed structure, it's the, the modeling tools actually work out pretty well. And then, again, the preview of the coming attraction, we can start putting floor plates on here, put loads, and it's not available on yours, but let me sort of show you where it is in here, and I think it's under add-ins. We can do the thing where we, oh, let's export that. Oh, it's interesting. I don't have it installed on this one. On my little uh, eTabs linker, something like that. I'll have to put it on this machine too. I, I work with several different machines when I'm doing demos. But yeah, we can export that directly to uh, like eTabs instead. Or uh, SAP or whatever it is that we want to kind of link them to. Okay. Enough with getting going with the sort of the structural modeling. I want to go ahead and kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about just models and levels of detail and kind of get you going on thinking about that, about sort of sort of what a conceptual model looks like, what a preliminary model looks like, and how we kind of move it forward between the different levels of detail. And then as you do that, how you can start thinking about the costs and some of the things you need to think about. Because the principle underlying the whole thing is that really at any point along the process, using the BIM modeling or just, you know, as we're making our design decisions and we create our models, you know, we have... Oh, from the very first time we put down any sort of idea about the form, we're already starting to say something about how many square feet we're putting in there, what the cost of the building is going to be. You know, everything, although we may not know it in great accuracy, you know, it's not completely unknown. There's always something to kind of guide us through. And I want to walk you through just a little bit of an exercise of how we start marching kind of down that path from conceptual kind of to more detailed because yeah, you're ultimately going to be very detailed, but you're sort of something we can say at every step of the way. Okay, and to do that, I'm going to actually close up Revit Structure, say goodbye to all that. I'm going to open up Revit Architecture and just start with a new blank model. And if you want to follow along, please do. Just kind of open up Revit Architecture. Let's start with something new. And we're going to start with the whole notion, what if we just have, oh, the note, you know, we're going to start with some preliminary design program and kind of make some early design decisions and kind of think about really how we can start, uh, you know, incorporating some of that stuff and using the BIM model to help us understand our design. So here's the basic scenario. The idea is early on in the process, you may have been given a program that says, oh, you have to create 250,000 square feet. Okay, and you have some site and... You know, you're supposed to come up with a shape and a form and do some architectural design for whatever's happening with the building. And early on, I still want to know, 
Do I have the right number of square feet? Do I want to have, you know, am I about the right cost? Whatever is going on here. And I want to know all that stuff without having to model every last door and window and put in every last feature. Because okay, early on, you sort of need to kind of get the shape and the orientation and how it relates to the side and the height. Figure that stuff out very quickly. Okay, so there's a whole way of using these BIM modeling tools called conceptual modeling. And let's just kind of create a real simple one, okay, and show you how to get some information out of that and then show you how that moves forward to being a more detailed model. So here's the scoop. If you want to do a conceptual model, there's this notion of something called a conceptual mass. Where as opposed to having all the walls and the doors and the windows and all the individual building elements, we're just going to think of it as a big block of form, okay, that has a shape. Kind of like you'd create in SketchUp or some tool like that. And to do it, what we're going to do is actually just go to the Massing and Site tab. Okay. There's going to be this thing called an in-place mass, and we can do it this way. We can also go ahead and bring in masses from SketchUp or from Rhino, or there's a lot of different form tools that people use to kind of create shapes and interesting things. Or we can create them right in here. I'm going to say that I want to create a new in-place mass. Okay, it's going to tell me that, you know, typically I don't show you all the masses. I only show the building elements. But since you're telling me you're going to create a mass, I'm going to show you those. It's going to let you know that. I'll say that's fine. Our mass needs a name, so I'm just going to call it our building form, conceptual form. Okay, and we're ready to start playing around, kind of like we were in SketchUp or something like that. Where really what we're going to do is we can, as we're trying to sort of think about the shape of our building, we can use any of kind of the standard kind of oh, form creation techniques. We can we can draw a profile and extrude it up. We can sweep something. We can blend something. There's all sorts of things that people do within 3D modeling programs to create different shapes. We'll go for a really simple one. I'll just go ahead and extrude something up that's relatively, oh, like L-shaped or kind of relatively controlled in its form. But you can kind of play around and do something a little bit more interesting. Where if, for example, we want to go through and what I'm going to choose is, oh, let me kind of even show you that again. I'm going to choose my drawing tools and grab the little rectangle. I'm going to come out here into the drawing area at level one. And I'm going to go through and just draw a rectangle out there. So I think my building might be somewhere oh, around this shape. Okay, that's enough to get ourselves started. Okay, I can choose that shape. And what I can do is say, if that shape is the shape I like, and I just want to extrude it up, I don't want to do anything too special with it, I can do something called creating a solid form. So create form, solid form. Let me kind of just flip it over to 3D and show you what it did. I'll roll it over to the 3D view. There it is. So I got basically just like a box. See if you can get that box or something that looks like it. Again, your box doesn't have to look like my box. It's not at all important that it does. Sort of somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. And if you've gone through and created a box and you have something like that, you can try sort of pushing and pulling on it. You can grab the top surface. Or you can grab the front surface, or any surface, kind of push and pull it around. One thing you can do if you really want to create a very sculptural form, and this is what all the architects like to do, is they'll take a box like this and say, oh, I just can't have a big rectangular box. I need to grab this edge and pull that out there. And then I need to kind of pull that up. And maybe this point over here, that's not quite pointy enough. So I am going to pull that this way and maybe up like that. And this part over here, oh, that's not very nice either. So I'm going to push that one in and maybe down. And all of a sudden now, I got something that's really hard for you to go ahead and grab and estimate and sort of start dealing some of the things with that you want to do. Because it's a perfectly valid form, but in this kind of unusual, twisty, kind of slightly distorted shape now, it's kind of hard to figure out how many square feet of building they're in there, what the cubic volume is of all that type of stuff. You need to kind of go through and figure out some of that stuff. So even if someone has created sort of an interesting form like this, or a very basic form, doesn't really matter, it all sort of works about the same way, I'd still like to be able to say something about that. So that's kind of an interesting shape because that actually has, can you see, that's kind of a warpy roof to it. Okay, but go ahead and create yourself some sort of nice warpy shape. Okay, let's start with that. 
Okay, just uh, something that looks interesting that you want to go ahead and kind of develop into a building. Yes. Yes, I'm taking it in place. Very good. Give it a name. And now we'll choose the drawing tools. And we'll start by just drawing that. That's good. Okay. And now let's grab the arrow tool, the modify, and we'll choose that sort of that shape. We'll say make a solid form out of it. Right there. Okay. And now what I like to do is I just rotate it up in the 3D by like, clicking on the whole house. And now I can sort of start pushing and pulling on it. Okay. So, you got some nice kind of twisty shapes to work with? If you're looking good, let's show you the next step. The deal is, even though it's kind of a twisty shape, I'd like to know how many square feet are in this thing. Am I meeting my program? I'd like to sort of know what the cost of this thing might be. I might want to know some information even with a sort of very preliminary shape. So, what you can do is as follows. Okay. If you got a shape you kind of like, just go ahead and say finish the mess. Okay, and there's going to be my shape. And the shape is out there. I can still sort of, you can probably still do this. Try grabbing on it and see if you can kind of, you probably can still do some pushing and pulling on it. It just sort of depends on how, how complex your shape is. Some shapes are very, very complex and they're hard to push and pull on. And we can even show you a whole discipline about how we can add parameters to these things so we can sort of numerically control and push and pull on the shapes and kind of try different sizes. But for now, I'm going to keep it relatively simple just so I can get you a, kind of show a good stopping point for today. So I got my basic shape. You got some sort of shape there? If you do, go ahead and say finish the mass because I want you to be able to kind of just click on that. And, or if you hover over it, you'll see it says mass, building conceptual form, little shape to work with. Okay, and if you got that, we're gonna go to the next step, which is can we take that shape and actually sort of divide it up into floors so we can start understanding a little bit more about it and quantifying what's in that shape. So to do that, what you want to do is as follows. Switch to one of the elevation views, and you'll see your shape relative to the floor levels. You'll see my shape is actually pretty tall relative to my floor levels. So I need to add some more floor levels to really kind of understand what's going on here. If I want to add some more floor levels, I can do the same thing, kind of what I did with the grids. I can take level and say pick lines and give it an offset, like every 12 feet or every 10 feet, whatever it is and add some more floor levels. That's kind of one way to do it. But you want to give yourself enough floor levels so that you're actually encompassing the entire shape, or as much of the shape as you want to be able to divide into actual building floors. So go ahead and see if you can kind of get yourself a bunch of different levels in there, because we're going to use those levels to divide up your shape. And again, I'm going to wipe my thrash, right? Let's do it again. We'll come back out, I'll say undo a couple times. And what I'm going to do is go to the Home tab, and I'll choose the Level tool. Okay, so Levels under Datum. And then with the Level tool selected, I can choose Pick Lines. I usually use this offsetting. I'll put in some floor-to-floor -floor offset. You can copy and paste, or you can draw them if you like to, but I'm, I like to offset. It's just kind of a quickie way to doing it. So I'll click there. See if you can just get yourself some more levels. Again, you don't have to get all the levels in there, but just see if you can get some more, enough to make it interesting. Get yourself at least uh, four or five levels, something like that. That'll make this a lot more fun. Yes? Yeah, so you're looking at a 3D view. So go to an elevation view. You know, we'll have to do it in the elevation. Again, not as a perfect floor plan, to go to the elevation. There you go. Okay. And now you can add the levels in. Okay, so let's see if you can offset them. And you're looking good. Uh, all right, that's fine. Okay, so here, let's go to level, and then choose the pick lines. It's the one that's, uh, there you go. And now let's give yourself an offset right in there. So go ahead and put in there, like, whatever you want your floor to floor to be. Oh, you're, you're going to the right place. You're doing pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Good back here? Okay, so here's what we're going to do next. You got some floor levels, you got a big old mass. You'd like to sort of be able to say, how much floor area is in this big old mass? So, what you can do is, and I can go back to 3D or whichever view you would prefer. 
What you want to do is choose that mass, and if you choose that mass, one of the choices that's going to come up way over in the corner is something called mass floors. And if you choose mass floors, okay, what will happen is it will give you a list of the different floor levels that you defined, and you can choose those different levels. And if you do, and say OK, what it's going to do is slice and dice its way through your mass and actually create a lot of floor levels there. Give you something that looks like that. Okay, so see if you can get to that. Go ahead and see if we can make some mass floors and actually just create a lot of little floor plates and everything's looking good. Okay, if you are, you're well on your way to being able to quantify this thing. Okay, you're looking good. Things looking fantastic. Oh, we're almost there. You got any floor levels in? Let's just mass floor it and we'll get that last little step in there. Can you do that again? Please? No worries, we will indeed. We'll say, let me undo that. So what happens is after you got your levels in there, just grab the mass, choose it. And after you choose the mass, say mass floors is under the modify mass tab. And then we can go, oh, one, two, three, just choose all the different levels you like. And it'll divide up into a lot of different floor levels. Now, here's the good thing about mass floors. Check out all those mass floors. They're actually little individual elements. And the nice thing about them is, if you select them, and you may have to tab to select them, but you, if you select one, you'll see in the properties palette, it'll actually tell you what the perimeter is, what the area of the floor is, what the floor volume is, which might be good if I'm sizing up an MEP, like a ventilation system. Yeah, got a lot of information all of a sudden to kind of size this up. And the cool thing about this is, if you come back over here to your mass and you push or pull or whatever it is you do to one of these arrows, okay, the mass floors update themselves right away. So we really quickly can just push and pull and see what's happening and very quickly get a numeric summary of what's actually happening in the building. Okay, so ah, now this starts getting interesting. Okay, so here's the deal. I got all my mass floors. My mass floors are looking fantastic over here. We're going to change that into a real building in just a few minutes. But even at this mass level, because I'm sort of just doing my conceptual design and deciding how twisty and how distorted I want my building to be, okay, I'd like to go ahead and have a summary to say, well, how many square feet are in that building? Or really better yet, how much is this building going to cost? Okay. So let's talk about how you can do that. Okay. Hanging around out here, there's all these individual mass floors. Super, I can grab these, go over to Excel, kind of type in all the values and kind of do it that way. But no reason to do that. Scheduling will let us actually tabulate everything just right within Revit. So what you can do is, let me see if there's a schedule set up. I don't think there is yet. Nope. We're going to create a schedule of the mass floors, the same way you can schedule doors and windows and everything else. We're just going to go ahead and create the under view, create a schedule. And of the different things we can schedule, one of the choices is mass floors. So if you choose mass floors to schedule, you can choose a couple things. I tend to put in the, the level, I'll put in the floor area, because I usually summarize that. I can add some more columns. Those are the big ones. You can put whatever you want in there. So you can say, I want to get in the level, because I like to know what that is. I can say that I want to put the floor area in. I'll put that in there. Maybe the floor volume in there. That's enough for right now. Say OK. So I got this nice little summary that's kind of talking about the floor areas and the floor volumes and things like that. OK, not too bad. However, if I'd like to put a subtotal on this, and I think in your BIM class you must have sort of looked at schedules and how to put totals and subtotals. Yeah, so it's not too bad. We're just going to go ahead and put some totals on this. I'm going to sort of sort it by level. Then I'm going to put a grand total in. And the final thing is, is I'm going to say under the floor area, let me just put a calculate a total there. I'll right align that. Okay, so I know this building right now has about 128,480 square feet. And the nice thing is, since I have it here, if I choose to tile my windows, let me close up some of these other windows, and I'll tile those again. I can do things like keep one window open over there. And as I start uh, pushing and pulling on the form, okay, you'll see all those things tally up. I got 143,000 square feet right now. 
Now I'm back to 133,000 square feet. I can start pushing and pulling and very quickly sort of getting some sort of information about the square footage of the building. Now, square footage of the building is really cool. We like that in terms of just sort of understanding architecturally the evidence space for all your program. And I can even start allocating different usages to each of the floors. These are parking, these are retail, these are office, whatever I need to do. But if you'd actually like to even go one step further and start, start thinking about a conceptual estimate, there's all sorts of rules of thumb we use to sort of say, you know, how are square footages related to the actual cost of the building? And more than anything, you learn this in your estimating classes, it's really related to historical data you have about similar buildings in this sort of region using a similar construction technology. They're all about the right size. And some people do it in terms of cubic feet, some people do it in terms of square feet. There's a lot of ways you can sort of do this, but you'll, you'll have some sort of metric that we can divide it and normalize it by some value and then we can apply it here. So as a real rough rule of thumb, let me try something where, oh, Maybe in the San Jose area, building this, this is going to be like $150 square foot building, more or less. And how do I know that? That's based on some historical data. But I'd like to sort of use that historical data relative to this building and sort of say what the, the cost is going to be. So what I can do is as follows. Okay. I got a nice table here. I'd like to be able to kind of use this table and put that $150 in there and somehow have the table report that value to me. And you can really easy. Let me show you how you do it. We'll take that schedule, and in the fields for the schedule, we'll actually add one in there. Because we have the floor area, we have all these things that are already in here. If we would like to actually add in something that does a calculation, we can add a calculated value. And if we add a calculated value, we can put in a formula. For example, as my calculated value, I can just kind of call it, oh, the conceptual cost. And what's, I'm going to have it be, oh, I'll just have it be a number. I could make it a currency. I'll just have it be, yeah, I'll make it a currency. Okay. And that's going to be equal to, let's say, floor area times 150 per square foot. Oh, actually, now I have to do this a little strange for one square foot. I have to always remember how to do this to sort of get the units to normalize out right. Let's see if I got it right. I might have to put the dollar sign in there. Nope. What's it not? Oh, it doesn't like the equal. I need to go back to Excel or not add it. Try it this way. Try that. And Okay, that actually worked. So I got a conceptual cost. I can go through and show that for each floor. Let me format it just so that is actually something that I'm going to calculate the totals for too. And I'm going to say that's going to be, it's his currency, it's understanding that. Okay, so somewhere in here right now, using that $150 square foot rule, I can tell I have about like $20 million for the building here or something like that. Okay, which is not too bad. I should probably do a better job of formatting that too. Let me say, oh, I do want to put the uh, digit grouping in there. I don't need the two decimal places, at least not for this level. Okay, actually, this is sort of a, a good sort of general principle. In fact, I think Bertrand liked it to think about this. Yeah, at this level, honestly, you don't need the dollars and cents. You know, you're probably good if you're within like the nearest $10,000 or something like that because you just don't really have that degree of precision. We're just pushing and pulling form around here, stuff like that. So don't use, don't let the tools fool, fool you into believing you have a lot more accuracy than you do. You, know, you don't. It's like, a, but in the same sort of sense now, if I have this sort of building and I start pushing and pulling on it, I can very quickly see, oh, that's a $15 million building. Or that's a $19 million building. Okay, and that's pretty good feedback to have just like that kind of quickly as you try to figure out how big it can be relative to what you want. Now, I can show you at another level, we won't do it today, it's going to be interesting time, and we'll pick it up next time, where we could actually even, on these floor levels, you got all these fields for each different floor level, we could assign each of these floor levels a different use. So I could say that, you know, level one is, oh, a garage. Level two is garage. Level three is retail. Level four is office. And actually start applying different costs per square foot to the different levels based on the usage. And that starts getting to be pretty interesting, too, because then all of a sudden you start uh, kind of creating oh, something, yeah, well, it's just kind of an interesting, you know, you're adding good things to this. If you want to do that, how we could do it is, we'll say fields 
Oh, I will basically go through and add a parameter to this. I'm going to call it like uh, my floor use. Okay. I said I wasn't going to do it, so what am I doing? I'm doing it. Okay, it's going to be a parameter of type integer. I'll make it integer. Those are sort of easier to work with sometimes as opposed to numeric values. Let me say okay to that. So I've got a column now that says floor use. So I could say, oh, these are level one, one. This is level, this is like a use two. That's what use two. Oops, excuse me. Two, and this is use three, 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 three. So I basically assigned a different use to each of those different floors. Okay. Given that, you can now go back and in your formulas if you want to. Start saying, oh, you know, for this conceptual cost, let me edit that. Okay. We can say, oh, you know, if, and we can sort of put an if condition in there and use different values in there. Actually, the way to do it that would be kind of cleaner is, rather than 150 here, I think it would be this, if, and I could say floor use equals two, and then I'll put in, oh, it's gonna be 100, and, oh, let's say it's $200 a square foot if the floor use is two, otherwise it's gonna be $100 a square foot. Again, that's not exactly a great model, but it'll sort of demonstrate the principle. Okay, say okay. Say okay. Okay, and now things have been adapted because if it's floor level two, it has, what was it? That was, uh, I forget what I did. <laughs> but I know if I switch from uh, two to one, it's gonna change the cost. Okay, so again, kind of a really quick way of getting sort of a conceptual estimate out of it, which is actually pretty useful. Because you know, you're sitting down with the developer, you're trying to sort of really get some quick feedback. You know, you're right on top of it because oh, you want to be a garage, it's a garage. You want it, whatever it is, you can really kind of do very you know sophisticated things there. So this level of modeling, this is like almost like in the scheme of like level 200 and level 300, this is like level 100. This is you know you, you don't got anything yet. You just got sort of a general shape. Okay, but let's start taking this model and saying great. Okay, you got this model. And we we're kind of hanging around in this very general form. We'd now like to go ahead and start kind of taking it to actually really being a building as opposed to just a conceptual form. So we've agreed that somehow this is a good conceptual shape. We kind of like the overall scope of what's going on in here. Let me show you a workflow, which is a really great one that helps you get started at that next level. And this is really going to be about just how we take this form and give it just sort of generic walls and generic floors and generic shapes. We'll get to ultimately a little 300 estimate where it has the uh, you know, individual wall surfaces and layers and really think a lot about it, but just at a high level how we can sort of transform it. Okay, so here's our model. It's doing okay. If you have a conceptual model and you want to take it to that first level of uh, detail, that next level of detail, we can use a great workflow that we call Building Maker, but you, you know, call it whatever you want. It's really just taking these conceptual surfaces and transforming them into building elements. Okay, and it looks like this. If I come out here to uh, the Massing and Site tab, there's actually these choices right here. Roof, wall, floor, and curtain system, which are kind of four generic ways of looking at things. And the idea is if we go through and choose one of those tools, for example, let me do the floor tool first. Maybe that's easier. If I know that our floors want to be changed from these mass floors into actual building element floors, okay, and again, I'm not going to at this point get into a lot of detail about whether it's lightweight concrete on metal deck or whether it's steel bar joists or whether it's just sort of a generic 12-inch floor. At this level, just the fact that it's 12 inches thick is enough to kind of hold place for it for this first level of modeling. I can then go ahead and just choose that floor. And I click on the different floors I want to convert. And after I've chosen the floors, I'll say create floor. And it'll actually make real building floors out of them. So let me zoom in on that and do it again. Why don't you try it too? Take yours, kind of try making some things floors. Create a floor. Okay. And you now have floors that actually map into that building shape. The same thing at that one. If you can get the floors, walls and curtain walls are going to come just like boom. It's just the same basic principle. So, see if you can kind of like just convert some of those surfaces 
And after you've got some, you're doing pretty good. Okay, fantastic. So just choose a couple of those, pop them in there. If you got floors and you like that, let's say we had to put a big old roof on this swoopy thing. That might be kind of hard to model any other way. But let me go back to, again, my massing in sight. I'll choose the roof tool. I'll say, let's go ahead and again, I'll choose what kind of roof. And maybe I'll like it the generic nine inch roof because I sort of know about the thickness, but again, don't want to think very much specifically about the material <laughs> properties just yet at this level. So I can go ahead and choose that form right there. And when I say create roof, it just made this kind of compound curving roof, whatever it is in there. Okay, as a final thing, I'm going to go ahead and make a couple of these walls out of glass. I'm going to make a couple of them just solid walls. Okay, and to do that, it's going to be the same basic operation. Also, under massing in sight, I'll choose the wall tool. That'll make the solid walls. Just kind of choose some size that I want them to be. Maybe that'll be one of my solid walls. And maybe, oh, I'll orbit this around a little bit. That'll be one of my solid walls. Okay, but those other walls, let me go ahead and make those out of glass. I'll say massing in sight, curtain system. And again, not worrying too much about the gridding or anything. Just enough to give me that. I'll create the system on that side. And I'll create the system on that side. Okay, looks a little messy right now because we got all that mass and all those elements kind of intermixed with each other. It's a little hard to tell what's going on. What I can do is actually just in this whole thing, let me just turn off the masses. Oh, I might have to do visibility graphics. Let me try that, VG for visibility graphics. And I'll just turn off the masses so I'm not looking at them. There we go. That is the building in terms of what's going on. And real quickly out of that sort of almost level zero model, I have a real model where if I go over to the floor plan views to level two or level six or level nine, I have the building, the shape of the building, the shape of those outside walls, they're all ready for me. And now if I need to start going through and putting in some interior walls or putting in a stairway or whatever it is that I need to put in there, for example, I'll just put a stairway in the building. I'll put in some interior walls. I'm going to sort of, oh, there'll be some, some corridor here. There's going to be something funky going on where I'm going to break this up into some rooms inside the shape. Whatever it is that's going to happen in there. But I can start with this kind of conceptual form, deprive those walls that way, and start adding in the interior elements too, and kind of work with them very fluidly. And it's all going to stay interlinked together. There's nothing really different between the conceptual model and those models. All those little walls that I just put on there, whatever floor they were. Oh, there they are. Jeez, I put them up on the roof. That's not very good. <laughs> okay. I am a loser. Let me put them back in there. There and... We'll say those are going to go down on level four instead. In the top constraint, I'm going to put them up to level five. How about that? Okay, now they're down in there. Actually, cool thing is, for all you fans of like copying and pasting, remember that whole thing about copying and pasting a line between all the structure elements? Works the same for your interior corridor walls and your bathroom core and your shear core and all that type of stuff. Put it on one level, copy and paste it up to the other levels, and you kind of real quickly have the core of your building kind of built that way. Okay, so you can do that stuff, get your building like this, that's all looking good. What will happen is, in the same sense though, and here's kind of where it gets kind of groovy. There's this whole notion of, you know, can you do a building like this and kind of go ahead and start adding the detail, but what if someone comes back and starts, still wants to start messing around with the shape and the form? You know, do you lose work? What really happens if, you know, someone starts to say, well, what if it actually tilts out another 15 degrees, or what if it does pull over another 10 feet, or so really what's going to happen to it? And let me show you what happens in that scenario just to finish up today. We'll go back to that. Oh, I'll show the masses. And I'll choose that mass. There it is. I can, uh, I'll see if I can get it to it. Sometimes I have to tab to get to these things. I'm getting all the curtain panels. The roof. There's the mass right there. 
I can push and pull it here, or I can go back. Let me just sort of edit it in place so you can sort of see the uh, shape. So, oh, here's this surface. I'm going to pull it out like that. Okay, I just did something weird to the shape right there. Stuff like that. Let me finish that twisting. You go, oh, but where? My building didn't follow. You know, oh, that's not good. Okay, like, not to worry. Go ahead and choose the face. Let me go ahead and see if I can get the face in there now. There's one. That's the curtain wall face. I can say update it. It'll remap itself back into the proper shape. The floors actually do a pretty good job already. Let me get the roof. I'll update it to the face. And let's see if I can get that. There's that vertical wall. I'll update it to the face. Okay. Oops. Looks like my floors didn't update. Oh, I have to update them to the face too? Okay. I always think of them as getting going automatically, but maybe not. Getting too many things, so I'll update those to face. The cool thing is, though, if you have it all in the model and it's doing this stuff, remember that old conceptual estimate that was floating around as a schedule? It's up to date because it's been keeping up with you. And what we're going to learn next time is that as we start moving our buildings from this conceptual stage into the more sort of preliminary stage and ultimately the detailed design stage, you know, we're going to have some schedules that we can maintain in Revit so we get immediate answers. Because I can even do for square footages of the surface of the building or square footages of the floor plates or a number of sort of the, what I'll call the principal building elements that will probably drive the cost more than anything. I can create schedules just right in Revit so that I get immediate feedback on those things. But then ultimately we're going to show you how you take this model into quantity takeoff and when we have the detail, we'll do a very detailed takeoff and count every door and window and every linear fit of railing and whatever's really driving the cost. Okay, so that's going to come up. But hopefully for today, we're giving you a sense of really, as you get going, how you start with the architectural model, even at a conceptual stage, but you're going to model an existing one. Get that, put the levels and grids, get your framework in place, and then from that we can just start adding levels of detail that'll let us start getting the early answers, but that'll follow us through so you can get better and better answers. As your model gets more detailed, you get better and better and closer answers. Okay, sure make sense? Beauty, let us break for today. We're gonna put the recordings of all this up on a website somewhere, so we'll have to tell you about where that's gonna be. And so that, you know, since, you know, there's so much, oh, you want to watch this again because you enjoyed it so much. Actually, you missed something because it went by at like lightning speed. Yeah, you'll be able to look back and sort of see what did he do and like uh, kind of capture some of that stuff. And any other parting remarks? Thank you. Thanks. Oh, no worries. My pleasure. We'll see you guys again in two weeks. But in the meantime, as questions come up and you need help, email and ask for Oak and we'll, we'll get a discussion going. Okay.